says hello in the San Francisco is lovely and sunny and not rainy like here and I've got to give you all the tutorial sheets that he wants you to do. Uh, number one. So there are two semiconductor tutorial problem sheets going sort of back. Make sure you get both of them. Number one, number two. See that all right? Fine. So yesterday we were looking at common emitter circuits and we spent a bit of time going over small signal model and uh, output characteristics, that sort of thing. Stuff that we've seen before in, in 118 if you're here and if not then you can see it in the videos if you need to if you haven't seen it somewhere else already. Today I want to carry on with the uh, one transistor circuits for a bit and have a look at the emitter follow-up or same, same thing as a common collector circuit <coughs> and we'll look at the uh, uh, sort of, uh, what do you call it, metrics by which you measure it, the, the things that are important. So voltage gain, input and output impedance, that sort of thing. And then we'll do the same for the common base connection. And then we will have covered the, the three one transistor circuits. And this is uh, good groundwork, really, because we will go on possibly in this lecture, possibly in the next, I don't really know how long this is going to take, um, to look a little bit at feedback systems from 118, and then we will go on to investigate what's inside an op amp. Um, of course, if you've blown one up recently in an amplifier lab, you will know damn well that what's inside an op amp is smoke, because that's what comes out when you blow it up. But actually, just before the smoke is something else. So the emitter follower is, is similar in some respects to the common emitter that's degenerated, except the resistance RL has disappeared, <coughs> and we're left now with just the collector connected to the positive power supply. This is a kind of voltage follower or buffer. That's to say, whatever Vs is, V out will be minus the 0.7 you need to, across the base emitter junction to turn on the transistor. Another way of thinking about it is if you only worry about the small signals, the 0.7 goes away and VO is approximately equal to VS, where VO and VS are in small letters. That's to say, small signals. You can have MPN or PMP versions, same as with a common emitter. And the point of this connection is to provide loss of current gain. And we'll have a look at what the current gain is in, in a bit. Another way of thinking about this circuit is that it's an impedance transformer uh, or a transfer resistor, which is what gets squished together to make a transistor. Depending on, if you were the signal you know, in the jam jar and you drop the signal on the circuit, it will see a certain impedance whichever way it tries to go. One of the cool things about transistors is they can adjust the impedances that the signals see. And that is not an extra thing that they do, it's a byproduct of how they work. And it's one of the reasons that we use them. If they didn't do that, we wouldn't be able to get things like power gain. So, same as with all the things that I'm doing in these first few lectures, RS contains the biasing components that you need. So, really, I need a resistor from the base of the. Uh, minus Vs, or resistor from the phase to plus Vs, in order to put the transistor into an operating region where it's going to be forward active region. But I'm just consuming all of those with an RS to make it look a bit nicer, or a bit cleaner. So, what's the voltage gain of the emitter follow -up? Well, I just told you it's about one. And you can remember that as a, if you need one in a hurry to buffer a signal, 
<coughs> you can just go to one and it will be to within half percent or so. But that's not really good enough. So we can have a look at the output circuit. That's the current generator in RE. So I'm looking at a loop here, which includes VO and GMVDE and RE. So I'll sum the, sum the currents on VE and then convert them into voltages. So I'll have VO is VBE times RE over 1 plus over there. Times 1 over RB plus GM. I don't really want to stand here and derive that because I don't think there's much benefit to it and you'll probably just fall asleep. I will probably fall asleep. But it is approximately VB times RE times GM under certain, under certain conditions. And we need a relationship, we've got to get rid of VBE. That's the, always the point, is to either get rid of VBE or get rid of IB, to leave only VS and V out, or I out and V in, or the things we care about. So to get rid of the intermediate bit, we'll use VS is IB RS plus VBE plus VO. So we'll sum up the voltages around the VS, RS, VBE and VO loop to write equation three. And then we can jiggle that about. Oh, damn. See that E there? It says RBE in the denominator of number four. The E should be little as well. It should be subscripted. So if we pop two into, into four and get rid of VBE, we'll end up with five. We can take it on trust for now, do it at home. And we can say some things. This is the important bit, it's being able to work out what the equation means. First of all, there's no minus sign, so the gain is non-inverting. And if RE is much, much bigger than RS upon beta, and RE is much, much bigger than GF, 1 over GM, it turns out that the gain will be about 1. If you don't like the idea of that, Try putting in some numbers that fulfill those conditions and see what happens. Later on we'll come to look at 1 over GM as, as a different thing, but for the moment I'll just leave it in because I haven't described it yet. But we could, if we wanted to, call it little r, little e, where the e is subscript. <coughs> so we know that we're only going to get a gain of about 1, so what's the point in having a circuit with a gain of 1? not going to get any voltage going, why should I bother? <coughs> well, if we look at the input resistance, that's to say, if I was a signal leaving VS, travelling <laughs> through RS, because that's my internal resistance, and trying to get into the circuit, how much impedance would I face? And of course, we'd like the, the input impedance to be much, much bigger than RS, because if it is, we won't have any potential division of the input, you wouldn't want to have an amplifier with a gain of one that had a potential divider of a half on the front because then your gain would be somewhat less than a half. So we'd like input impedance to be very, very big because this is a voltage amplifier. If we go back to 118, we said our voltage amplifier is high input impedance, low output impedance. Current amplifiers, very, high, very low input impedance, high output impedance and all that. It's in the, it's in the 118 lectures anyway. So, input impedance, VB upon IB. So this will give me an R, because it's volts over amps, which is ohms. And if I look at what VE is, I'll say it's the same equation as prior slide. VB, RE, <coughs> brackets, 1 over RE plus GM brackets. And then I add up the voltages in the, v, in the input loop. I'll have VB, which is voltage on the base, top of the slide, is VBE plus V out. Sorry. Oh yes, I did put in. So I've got V out across RE and I've got VE on the emitter. They're equal to each other, same thing. So here I use VE, but you could put VO if you want, same, same business. 
So if we shuffle around, what are we shuffling around? Shuffle eight, seven and eight together. Yeah, so it's eight into seven will yield nine, which is BB plus BBE, RE, all the stuff from above. And then we can jiggle it again to get all the VBEs outside the brackets, or we can put some brackets around everything else and take VBE out, and that will give us 10. So between 9 and 10, I just factored the expression to give me VBE. And then you have to use a bit of trickery. We will say, oh, well, VBE is IB times RBE, and GM times RBE is beta. So then you can shuffle 10 into 11. This is, you have to try it with a pen and paper and see what... You will go wrong a few times. I still go wrong a few times. I sit there in front of my PC and just start crossing bits out, trying to work out what the correct assumptions are to get a nice small equation, which is still basically accurate. If you don't like it, you can try textbook, but they're probably the same as me. They'll just go, and if you assume this and this and this, this happens. As if it's blindingly obvious when it's not. It takes quite a bit of working out and thinking about what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. Because if you get it wrong, you'll get an answer which isn't representative of, this, representative of the circuit. I don't pretend that it's easy. Generally speaking, beta plus one times RE is much, much bigger than RBE. If you don't fancy that, just pop some numbers in. Say beta is 100, make RE, I don't know, 10 ohms. Um, and then for RBE, you'll have to pick a collector current and do QIC upon KT, and then that'll give you GM, and you'll do beta upon GM will give you RBE. Stuff that in as well, and it, it pops out that beta plus one times RE is almost always much, much bigger than RBE. <coughs> do you want me to go through that again? If you wanted to check <coughs> that 11, or the beta plus 1 RE is much, much bigger than RBE, what the hell is that? Somebody's been doing with ions and stuff and things. So. There's clearly some sort of ancient group battle over here, because this is marshland. Uh, we'll get rid of that. And this was the opposing army. Get rid of them. So we have. Uh, so if you say beta is 100, just say. It's usually a pretty good value to pick. And we'll make RE something fairly small, maybe 10 ohms. And we need to know what RBE is. So we've got to pick a quiescent collector current. So if I pick IC is 10 milliamps, then I'll have EIC over KT. This will be 1.6 times 10 raised minus 19. That will be 10 times 10 raised minus 3. That will be 1.38 times 10 minus 23. It's Boltzmann's constant. And this will be about 297.15, <coughs> which is about 20 degrees C. If I stuff all that in, it's going to come out at about 0.38 milliamps. Sorry, amps. Not milliamps. Per volt, which will be my GA. I didn't work that out, I just know that 10 milliamps gives that answer, more or less. You can check it if you like. Um, oh, I should say GM, should I? And then I've got to say, well, RBE is uh, beta on GM. If you have a hard time remembering if it's GM over beta or beta over GM, RBE is almost always bigger than beta. I totally didn't look at the equation then. And GM is always, almost always, less than 1. So if I need a number here, which is bigger than that number, and I know this number is almost always less than 1, this form is probably right. If I had it upside down, it wouldn't end up that way. So if, you, if for some reason it provides a little block for you. Yep, go. How many of there are you? Yeah, there's, there's a five of them, don't I? I did 130. I didn't think that many people would turn up <coughs> after yesterday. If you've still not going at the end, I'll get some more done. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, so 100 over 0 0.38 is uh, about 3 on the know. What is that? Somebody do it. What works? 240. 240 ohms. I'll take it on the trust, and that's right. Definitely got to be bigger than 100 anyway. That's omega. So, what am I saying? Beta plus 1 times RE, much, much bigger than RV. So, 100 times, uh, 101 times 10, 1001, much, much bigger than 240. And that's true. That's, that's is what you should do if you're sat there going, why? If you're not sat there going, why? You haven't understood it. So if we've got Ri, the input resistance, which is Vb over Ib, is Re plus all that stuff I had, beta plus 1 times Re, I can get rid of the Rbe because I know that beta plus 1 times Re is bigger, a lot bigger. I pick fairly unrealistic numbers there to make them nearly the same, it's only about a fifth difference. I see 10 milliamps quite high. RE 10 ohms quite low. <coughs> so we'll get rid of the RBE and just say that the input resistance is beta plus 1 times RE. If we go back and have a look at the non degenerated common emitter circuit, it's in the notes from yesterday, it's the one that looks like this. Oh, I missed the resistor. Here's RL, that's a lot of non-degenerated. Now, if we go back and compare the input resistance of the circuit we're looking at now, which is that one, with the input resistance of this one, what we're really asking is, does RL make any difference to the input resistance? wouldn't ask it if the answer wasn't important. Um, what are these really well? <coughs> Firstly, the input resistance of the circuit we look at now is bigger. And it's bigger by a factor which is controlled by RE. So the resistor here is quite important. And the resistor in this position is giving us the feedback which lowers the gain of the common emitter circuit and increases the input impedance of the common emitter circuit and increases the input impedance of this circuit as well. This position is important because the phase current and the collector current flow into it. Phase current goes down there, collector current goes down there. So there is some coupling now between the collector current, which is an output thing. If you want voltage output, we just put a load resistor in there. <coughs> By Ohm's law, we'll get a voltage drop. So the Collector current flows down here, which is our output thing, and a base current flows down here, which is something to do with our input. It's not VBE, but it's to do with VBE through RBE. So this position allows putting something here, stopping this from being ground, or minus VS, allows us to couple things that happen in our output to things that happen in our input. And that's what feedback is, as opposed to feed forward, which is to couple things from the input to the output. But that's another story. So it's not easy to see that RE should increase the resistance looking in there by just looking at the circuit. There's nothing to give it away. But with a bit of analysis, you can show that it's true. The reason this is important is, where are we? Either at the end of today or tomorrow, we will start looking, not tomorrow. Wouldn't it be great if I lectured every day? <laughs> Next week, or later today, we will look at a couple of circuits where there are many transistors that interact. And we have to know what the signals are going to see when they look at the other transistors. If we just drew a massive small signal model of a five transistor circuit, we could spend three weeks and a roll of wallpaper doing the calculations. So all these little approximations are there to make our lives easier. The trick is knowing what approximations you're allowed to make. 
So, last one of the three. We've done common emitter yesterday. We just had a look at common collector or emitter follower. So, a common base. This is one of my favourite circuits. That shouldn't really come as a surprise because I've got favourite transistors, so <coughs> I should have favourite circuits too. In fact, I spent three years working on a common base amplifier. It was great fun, I can tell you. Um, you can read about it on the website if you want. So, this is a, a curious amplifier because it's very rarely found on its own. You would almost always have it connected to another transistor. And in fact, secretly, you've all been exposed to one. In the first year construction project, there's a cascode of a JFET and a bipolar transistor, and a cascode of two bipolar transistors of different types, and it's folded to make the, the biasing point on the ground. Lots of people mistake it for a differential amplifier. So the top transistor in the cascode is the common base one, and it's driven by the one below and they act together to produce something which is better than one transistor can on its own. So we'll have a look at the common base as if we're just going to use one to see how it is on its own. Then we'll worry about how we put them together. So IE is the input current. I'm looking at the small signal diagram on the left, on the right now. And it's equal to I0 plus IB. <coughs> I0 is just another word for IC in this situation because that's the output current. So IC, IO. Also. And IO upon IC is actually slightly less than 1. In fact, it's alpha, and if you. alpha as opposed to beta. Alpha is the common base current gain, beta is the common emitter current gain. And if you're in your <coughs> semiconductor mood, you can work out alpha from the injection efficiency and so on and so forth. In fact, I bet in the tutorial sheet somewhere it'll come up eventually. Alpha is just a number that represents how good a transistor is like beta. And it's usually about 0 0.99, 0 0.98 at the minimum. It doesn't really wander out of that range. So let's sum up the currents at the, emit at the emitter node, so input node. We'll have IE, which is our input current, plus IB, plus GMVBE equals zero. And if you look at that, what's wrong? I screwed up. made a mistake. Yeah. Well, you, you've got a choice. I've got I've drawn IE flowing up the page, which means it's going, oh, it's going in. I didn't screw up. You can have a biscuit anyway. Otherwise, I'll sit and eat more. very bad to feed bears chocolate, it upsets their metabolism. Um, right, so the reason it is plus and I didn't screw up is IE, IB and GMVB all flow into the node. A momentary lapse. So the slide is correct. So they all have to equal zero otherwise I create some energy and I can't do that. So then we'll sub in voltages and resistances for the currents. So each term in 17 needs to be a current in the end. So we've got volts minus volts over ohms, amps. Volts over ohms, amps. The BE in the RBE should be subscript. Sorry about that. And plus GMVBE, well GM is, GM is 1 over ohms. And volts is on top of that. So you've got volts over, sorry, GM. Yeah, it's one over ohms. Yeah, so damp. So they're all currents, which is important. If it's not dimensionally correct, no point in carrying on. And we know a couple of other things as well. We know that VE plus VB is zero. We know that because if I take the voltage on the emitter node, which is a bit above RS, and I look at VBE, the other end of VBE is connected to the ground. So VB and VE must be equal to each other. And that's another way of saying that when you add them up, they start to zero. So V is minus VBE. And we can solve 17 
for VBE by just replacing the VEs in it by VBEs because they're well, minus VBEs and then shuffling it about to get VBE we'll end up with VS over a load of stuff is that a question or are you having a bit of a scratch? having a bit of a scratch, ok don't blame you um, and if we allow 1 over RBE to be approximately equal to GM over beta you can prove that by the equation that I gave yesterday to do with RBE, beta, GM, VBE and we assume that beta is much much bigger than 1 which you almost always do because we say it's 100 for a ballpark figure that all collapses down to VS over 1 plus GM RS with a minus sign in the front if I, I could just not approximate and I could just get nine, uh, 18 and stick it straight into 20, which I'll talk about in a minute. And if I did, I'd get a really big equation. And it's not just because I like my slides in columns and I don't want a long equation. It's because that the long equations are very difficult to, to uh, manipulate. And when you lose the ability to easily manipulate the equation, it's difficult to figure out what it means in terms of the circuit. Do you follow? There are two things you have to be able to do. Look at the circuit and get the equation out. Manipulate some equations and then figure out what that means in terms of the circuit. If you, the two steps, the important steps are circuit to first equation and last equation to meaning in circuit. The actual mathematics don't matter. Not really. As long as you can manipulate some you know, linear equations, it's not so hard really. Not compared to what's coming anyway. Not, not from me, mind you. If you took some electromagnetics people, they would say there is no mathematics in circuits whatsoever, because they wouldn't even count this. So anyway, if we look at the output circuit, we know that VO is, is I out times RL. Uh, we just apply Ohm's law to the load resistor. And we can say that must be equal to minus GMVBRL, because I out is equal to GMVB with a minus sign in front because we've only got one we're all in this business here so whatever current flows in the control current source must be the current that flows in the load resistor and we can put the approximated version of, of 18 which is 19 into 20 and we'll get rid of VBE always trying to get rid of VBE got a real grudge against it so VR over VS is what we solve for because that's the voltage gain, which is the parameter we're interested in right now. And it will turn out that it's GMRL over 1 plus GMRS. And if we say that little r little e is 1 over GM, which I will prove in a bit, maybe, we can rewrite that as RL over RE plus RS. So the things that we can say about the circuit, given that really quite a small equation considering what we had along the way there's no minus sign so the gain is non-inverting the gain is proportional to RL if we make RL bigger and RS stays the same we should get more gain there will be some limitations for example a, a quiescent IC must flow through RL so you can't make RL a mega ohm and have big IC as a milliamp unless you're prepared to have a thousand volt power supply to run your circuit. Let's do Ohm's law with the numbers I gave. So there are limits. What? Okay. Where's the diary should it be on me? Well, in 21? Yeah. No. Because we are getting rid of the two GMs by subbing this into that bit to yield that. Pretty sure. Where's the paper notes from yesterday? If they, if they match, then it's okay. Um, yeah, so if RS is much, much bigger than R of RE, 
the gain is controlled by RL over RS. Now we're not in control of RS usually, but we are in control of RL, so we can pick our gain. Pick our gain based on a resistor we get out of the box with a number that says the resistance on it. That's the important thing. Oh, I'm having a stretch. Yeah. A stretch and a scratch. It's because it's warm in here. So, what about input resistance? I've got to try and find an expression for the impedance of signal Cs if it's sat at the top of RS having a good old think about getting to the ground. Could go back through RS, but we're going to take RS away so that it can't go that way. So if we're looking into the emitter, we've got to do VE upon IE, and it turns out that it's VE upon minus VBE over RBE, minus GMVBE, so it's the, the currents that are flowing up there, dividing through the voltage on that node. So VBE upon RBE is IB, it's minus IB actually as it's drawn, and GMVBE, obviously I've drawn with minus sign, so it goes up the page now. So they are two currents. I divide the voltage on that node by those two currents. I find the resistance looking into that node. And then since VE is minus VBE, we can do a bit of substitution for 22. Get rid of the VBE on, on the box times. Replace the VE. Shuffle it about a bit. We know that GM is much, much bigger than 1 over RBE. The reason is there's a beta in there. So we can pull it all down to so RI is 1 over GM. And 1 over gm is also the value that we call little r, little e. And for this circuit, if you put in some reasonable numbers, you will almost always find input impedance is between 0.1 ohms and about 500 ohms. So this is different from both of the prior circuits, where we had some feedback, in the case of degeneration, which increased the input impedance. And we were quite keen on that because if you've got a voltage amplifier, you want a nice big input impedance. So we have a very low input impedance here. So what kind of amplifier could we make? Current amplifier. Why is that? Yes, why? Uh, what? They don't draw any voltage from the source. So that. Yes, that's definitely worth a couple of listening. If you didn't catch that, there you go, help yourself. Well, you could try to make a current amplifier. And the reason we would do that is a current amplifier ought to accept any current into its input without producing a voltage at its input that might impede the flow of that current. So, zero input impedance is ideal current amplifier. <coughs> so, this is not ideal by any means, but is of the, one, of the amplifiers we've seen so far, this is the first candidate for a current amplifier. There is another model of a transistor which I'm not going to talk about called the T model. Actually, there are many, many, many models of everything. Um, but as far as transistor models for low frequency circuits, which is what we deal with in this course, and in 118, you're stuck with hybrid pi model, which is what I'm using, or T model. The T model is a reformulation of the pi model. Uh, or maybe the pi model is a reformulation of the T model. Difficult to say. But the pi model is the one that most people like, certainly in, in British institutions. T model is more popular in America. And the pi model is a... It feels more realistic. When you think about how a transistor works, you can see how the resistance appears in the base network and why you're in control of a current source, because you're in control of the ratio of the carriers which is getting through the base region. The T model isn't quite so, doesn't make me happy. You may find the T model is very nice for you, and if you want to investigate it, then by all means, Google it and you'll get loads and loads of results. 
So the, the Pyman was the only one I'm going to use, and the original paper is by a guy called Gia Coletto. Um, and if you click the link in the slides, if you've got an electronic copy, you can go and have a bit of a read. But it's not a very nice paper to read, because he assumes he's as, you're as clever as he is. And he doesn't spend too many words worrying about explanation. <coughs> That's all I've got to say about one transistor circuit. There will not be any tutorial sheets on one transistor circuits, and a one transistor circuit will not turn up in the exam. So the only reason that we did that lot is because I think it's useful for you to have it before we go on to stuff which I'm actually worried about. In other words, you need that prior stuff. So just because the guy has no exam on it doesn't mean that you should immediately forget every word. The next thing we want to talk about, we're heading, heading towards uh, OPAM. So we need to worry about some feedback for a bit. And this slide is dropped straight out of 118, uh, possibly with the odd spelling correction. And it's the feedback system, which is general, but set up to represent the OPAM. Would anyone care to say what its features are that make it OPAM like? Or is that a bit too much? I'll give you four or five biscuits. Nobody fancies it. So, if you've done the amplifier lab day two, which, what, third or half of you have now? Who's done amplifier lab so far? It's a thin third. A quarter, maybe. So we know that we've got a big gain AV, big open loop gain, and that is equal to G, and that we have to give some feedback to decide what our closed loop gain will be. That's the gain of your circuit. We never usually experience the open loop gain. If we do, we probably do something wrong. So our, the gain that we will get for our closed loop circuit is decided by the values of H, and we're usually using a couple of resistors to set that value. If G is really, really big, V out over V in collapses approximately to 1 over H, which is really useful because once again we've got an amplifier with a gain that we can set with two resistors that we pick out a draw whose values are written on the draw. So you don't have to worry about which op amp you're using, you're, you're in control of the circuit parameters. When we look inside the op-amp, we can see actually it's, it's laid out pretty much like this, except there's no feedback, because we have to provide that ourselves. So, this is what I want to look at. <coughs> Just got time to have a bit of a think about it. So there are three stages. We have differential amplifier, which is this bit. We have, a, okay, this is a voltage amplifier, but and if you look at books, they will say, oh, this is the voltage amplifier stage. That makes it sound like this doesn't do any voltage amplifying. Actually, it does. In some situations, it's nice to have a gain of less than one here. Um, but I don't want to get too much into that. The point is, we call this voltage amplifier stage. But that does not exclude this stage from amplifying voltages as well. And then we've got an output stage here. And that is there to provide current gain. If you were to think about just Q4, and imagine that Q5 is not there, you would say, ah, which kind is it of the three kinds we had a look at? Q4 on its own, imagine everything else not there. You can put RL in if you want. What not? Emitter follow. Have another biscuit. And you need to move them. So it's emitter follow. So Q5, also emitter follow. Or not? Don't answer. Is Q5 an emitter follower? Come on. Guess. Yes? Yes? You see, you guessed and won a biscuit. Catch? You better duck. And you better duck as well. Yes. <coughs> That uh, years of rugby weren't wasted. Um, right. Not very recent years, mind you. 
So, if we were to draw some little lines down, and we had a, a very stretched out op amp, we have a thing that subtracts the inputs. It's a difference amplifier, subtractor. You will have seen an op amp version of the difference amplifier in 118, because I always like to set it on the exam. Um, it's in the notes as well. <laughs> and then we've got something that provides most of G, which is our enormous gain. AV is what we call it on the data sheet. And then we've got a thing at the output which allows us to drive big current. <coughs> and when I say big, for those of you who've done the uh, amplifier lab, big in op-amp terms means about 20 milliamps, generally speaking. So the op-amp will not work properly without feedback. Feedback is there to control the gain of the circuit, but it also defines the DC conditions. Without the feedback, if you just put an op amp in, plug it in a board, put some power to it, no feedback resistor, the output will definitely be either V plus, positive power supply rail voltage, or V minus, because there will never be balance between the non-inverting input and the inverting input. There will always be a little difference, however small, and AV is enormous, so it will be doing V out is AV, V plus, minus, V minus, off amp equation, and it will never re be in the range plus 15 to minus 15. It'll always be a really big number, and the op amp will try and drive its output to whatever that big number is, and it will get to its power supply, and then it'll stop, because it can't go any bigger. So the feedback is there to control the DC as well. In fact, the feedback will adjust the input voltage in order to achieve the internal voltage drops required for the proper operation of the circuit. That is to say, the circuit will work because the feedback makes it so, and the values in the circuit will become the values they need to be in order to satisfy the feedback. That's what the feedback is. If VI is zero, VI will be made the value that it needs to be in order to make V out zero. There is no feedback in, in this, that slide. If there was, the general mechanism is to take the voltage on the top of RL through a network of resistors, potential divider, and put it into the base of Q2. And if you did that, you'd have made a non-inverting op-amp amplifier. You can make an inverting one as well. Um, but you can work out how to do that quite easily. So this circuit, I need to read this slide while you guys look at the other slide, so I've got to find my notes. <coughs> there we go. Right. So V plus equals V minus equals zero. So if I make V in zero, the two base voltage on Q1 Q2 should be equal. And that means V1 and V, or V1 and V2 will be about 0.7. The reason is, let's assume both transistors in the forward active region, they should both have 0.7 volts on their base emitter junction. If I'm forcing the base to zero, the emitter must be at plus 0.7, because they're PMP transistors. Happy? Not very happy. That means I can provide some um, equation for IE based on Ohm's law, because I know that I've got the resistor RE upper end is at plus VS, which is usually 15. No, I put 15, I put VS. So upper end of RE is at plus VS, lower end of RE is at plus 0.7. So if I do VS minus 0.7 upon RE, I should get IE. And then IE has some choice to make because it's going to flow to the resistor, which is sometimes called the tail, and then it'll either go through the emitter of Q1, or it'll go through the emitter of Q2, or what else? Nothing else. It's got to make that choice. If both of these transistors, Q1 and Q2, are biased exactly the same, which they are, because they've grounded their input, and their emitters are connected together, so they've both got the same VBE, and they're identical, 
that's to say same transistor made on the same day in the same foundry by the same machine etc 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 I should have equal current split between them generally speaking the current split is exceptionally good that's to say it's equal Now IC1 has two functions. If we look down here, when I choose this resistor, I've got a couple of constraints. I know that the current in R1 has to be the same current as in Q1's collector, and that has to be half of whatever IE is, because the current should split evenly. The other thing I know is that V01 should be 0.7, because of this transistor here is gonna be in its forward active region, should have 0.7 volts across the VVE, no degeneration resistor. So this is minus Vs, so this must be minus Vs plus 0.7. So I've got 0.7 across here. But I also know the current, because the current's going to be half of IE. So I don't have any choice in the value of that resistor. Once I've got my IE, that value is picked for me. If I choose anything else, I will end up with a voltage here, which is bigger or smaller than 0.7. If it's much smaller, the transistor will be switched off. If it's much bigger, the transistor will be switched on very, very hard. What time is it? 10 to. Righto. Have I got anything else important to say? We'll carry on next time. <laughs>